Good morning. David, firstly, thank you for the invite to come over to Ireland today. It's um, As somebody that sits in New Zealand and thinks a lot about how New Zealand becomes a more prosperous country, one of the countries my attention turns to very regularly is Ireland, as I see it, you as a, a country that has many of the, the characteristics that we in New Zealand need to be thinking about and ensuring that we're actually embedding into our production <laughs> systems. What, what I've been asked to do by David today is really give a bit of an overview of things from a, a global perspective as, as I travel around the world, what sort of issues are we talking about um, in relation to the food and agricultural systems globally. But I've, David's also asked me to talk a little bit about New Zealand and some of the, the traits that we're seeing in New Zealand, some of the, the characteristics of our, our system, some of the challenges and some of the opportunities we face, because I think there is quite a lot of similarity in, in many of those factors. So what I thought I'd do is I'd break that down into four sort of key themes. First is around those key influences on the global agricultural system. Secondly, a little bit around what, what I'm referring to as a customer-centric industry. I've become a huge believer that if we're going to do agriculture in New Zealand or anywhere in the world, it's got to be aligned to what people need. A large part of the market is that that's subsistence. That's about just supplying sufficient food for people to eat. But I think for countries like New Zealand, like Ireland, it's absolutely critical that's actually targeted on a very thin sliver of customers that have the greatest ability to pay. Because as developed countries that rely heavily on our food and agricultural systems, we need to get a better return out of these assets than we're getting at the moment. I then talk just a little bit about the license to operate and I suppose my, my perspectives around a sustainable industry and we've been doing a lot of thinking around that area as to how we get move things towards becoming more sustainable, a better use of the, the natural environment and getting that balance better than it is at the moment. And then I'll, I'll finish up with some conclusions on New Zealand's sort of strengths and weaknesses and how I perceive those in relation to the situation in Ireland. So kicking off. In terms of how I think about the, the wider world, there's um, four key themes I, I, I break things down under. Economic and political environment, the natural world, production opportunities, and what's happening in the market. If you look at the economic and political environment first, there's, there's some fundamental things that I think most people accept are going to happen. We're going to move from around about 7 billion people in the world now to about 9 billion people. Off that growth in people, the most startling thing when you break into the statistics is around about 1.8 billion of that growth is actually going to be in Africa. Africa is a country that can't feed itself already, or a continent that can't feed itself. So that creates a real challenge for our global food system. We're also going to have people living in different places. We've, we've had a rapid trend of, of urbanization. You know, that's been driven particularly in China and India, those, those key, key sort of large growth economies. We've just reached 50% of the world population living in cities. But more startling, startlingly is between now and 2050, we're going to have around about 64 million people a year moving from rural areas into cities. That's the equivalent of about three new Shanghais a year. If you put it into that context, that creates a huge extra demand for different types of protein. As people move into cities, they become more complex. And when I was in, as David mentioned, I was in Russia earlier this year. And I was amazed when I was visiting our clients there. And they've got some beautiful land. And the one we were talking to in particular, 150 hectares of black soil land in Voronezh in southern Russia. Absolutely high quality land. And they're still running their farms there. They showed me the, the, the staff chart. And down the bottom there was milkmaids. And I said, you don't really mean milkmaids. And they said, yeah, you know, they milk the cows using their hands. And I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> This is somebody coming from New Zealand where we've got fa fairly automated dairy production systems. But fundamentally, these farms are still being run as Stalinist farms. So if you look at areas like Russia, like Brazil, like um, um, the Ukraine, there's huge potential there to increase production. Not, not just small increases in production, but step changes in production. And if we get the capital in place, and if we get systems starting to work, um, utilizing global best practice, there will be a dramatic uptick in production in these regions. You now, Fonterra is working in Brazil at the moment to introduce New Zealand genetics into, the, into a Brazilian farming system. If that actually is successful, they, they, they're estimating they can increase the production, still using pastoral systems, by between five and ten times the amount of milk being produced by Brazilian dairy farms. So huge opportunities for growth. Equity and consolidation. One, one of the themes that we've had a series of global calls with our, our 
our global network of agribusiness professionals, the number one thing that came out of many of those calls was the, the desire amongst private equity investors, professional investors, sovereign wealth funds, the large private equity players to actually start to look at having agriculture in their investment portfolio. There is a real shift of professional money starting to globally look at agriculture as a, a category and look through, I suppose, the traditional reticence to invest as a result of volatility. That, that, that is great from one perspective because it means we're suddenly in the game with the global food story is now a compelling story that people are interested in and, and starting to look at the opportunities. But equally, I think when we start to get to the, the situation, it does mean it changes the asset values, it changes the perceptions people have of assets. And I think for countries like Ireland and New Zealand, it's critically important that we actually do view our agricultural assets as strategically important assets. And I'm not sure historically we've done that. I know definitely in New Zealand we tend to look over those. One area that when you've got more people living in cities, you've got a greater sophistication in your rural areas, you've got a growth in middle class. And what this slide's showing is an indication of how that middle class growth is going to occur. So by 2030, it's estimated there's going to be around about 3.2 billion middle class consumers in Asia Pacific alone. Now, what, what is a middle class consumer? Some definitions have that as somebody that earns more than about $2 a day. This is actually based on an OECD definition, which means they're consumers that have discretionary spending power. They've moved from spending money purely on a basis to get enough food to eat to starting to be able to spend money to make lifestyle decisions about how food influences and enhances their lifestyle. I.e. they're consumers that have greater ability to buy the premium products that we can produce in developed countries. From my perspective, this presents a huge opportunity because these people, as I will talk about shortly, also eat very different proteins. They're much more interested in animal-based proteins. They're moving away from grain-based proteins. So you're getting a very different type of consumer. The other driver around economic and political um, considerations is the actions of government. And from my perspective, sitting in New Zealand, I see things like the reform of the common agricultural policy as one of the great disruptive events that's going to hit the global agricultural system and particularly hit a country like New Zealand that's targeted on strong growth in key markets like Asia. I, I see the fact you're being unleashed and being given the opportunity to grow your businesses, the fact you've now got a chance to innovate to increase productivity as being a key factor in you know, a significant uplift in production and if you get your structures right, a significant uplift in market penetration. I think those farmers that are sitting in Norway and getting 61% of their income in the bank account before they actually get out of bed um, will find life quite difficult. But I actually think for most farmers across the, the, um, the, the, the developed world in particular, there, there will be an increase in innovation. There will be a greater awareness of market pressure. And I'm pretty sure when you look at some of the figures that come in later in the presentations, a demonstration that that actually results in more production and better economic outcomes. Moving on to the natural environment, I think the, the basic assumption there is, from my perspective, land supply is fixed. The opportunity to grow land supply is quite limited. If anything, we're seeing in New Zealand and, and other countries in Asia Pacific quite significant reductions in available land. You know, the, the Christchurch earthquake is one example I can point to where. As a result of the Christchurch earthquake, Christchurch itself is changing shape and the best productive soils in New Zealand in the Lincoln area south of Christchurch are suddenly becoming subdivisions for housing and accommodation. So even in a small agricultural focused country, we're seeing changes in shapes and cities taking out very high quality agricultural land. Biosecurity can never be overlooked. I think we're, we're lucky in both New Zealand and, and Ireland that you know, biosecurity in these countries is tight. We have a competitive advantage in from a disease-free status, and it was great arriving at the airport yesterday. It's only the second airport I think I've arrived at in the world where you hit the biosecurity barrier before you go through customs. And you know, it's great to see a country that has that same focus on ensuring and protection of the border. But the incursion risk is not going away. Trade only increases that incursion risk. And from my perspective, it's very, very important that we do continue to focus on how we manage incursion risk. 
It's also interesting that biodiversity is moving up the agenda very quickly. Companies like Unilever have been really driving their, their purchasing decisions around what, what does that product do to an overall eco, ecosystem health. And from our perspective, what we're seeing is more pressure coming on people to look at the wider community, the wider environment that the product's being driven in as part of the, the decision-making process as to whether they're going to procure somebody from a supplier or something from a supplier. I don't think we can afford to ignore biodiversity. It needs to become a much more significant part of our decision-making process. I'm personally still one of these people where the jury's out on climate change. I can see the data and the science, and I, I, I listen to the arguments. But what I do see, and it's been amazing just in the last week, David and I were talking about this in the car on the way down, the amount of climate shocks we are seeing. And it just feels that those climate shocks are becoming more and more frequent around the world. And what that means to me is that we've got to have greater resilience in business systems. We can't afford to be running systems to the, to the nth degree and not being prepared for the, what the climate's going to throw at us. So whether climate change is occurring or not, I'm, I'm, I've, that's not for me to comment. But what I do know is we need to design business systems that have the resilience to cope with that unexpected climate variation. We saw that in New Zealand earlier this year when we had the deepest drought for 70 years. It showed very quickly there was very little capacity in our system. As a consequence, we'll take two or three years to recover from that. Water cannot be ignored. I think both Ireland and New Zealand are in a position where we have a lot of free available water. This, these are from some stats released by the ANZ Bank um, earlier this year. Shows 75.6 million litres of fresh water per capita in New Zealand. I think Ireland would probably have very similar statistics to that. What that means from my perspective is both countries cannot afford to be wasteful of water despite the fact we've got strong water resources. Globally, water is scarce. How people expect you to behave with water and how you are expected to use water will be a determination of how people buy their products from you. So that water footprint is becoming as common as the carbon footprint. So ensuring that water is used appropriately, we invest in grey water recycling, we design systems that are efficient from a water perspective is very important. And this brings it together because I think when I ask people generally around the world what does sustainability mean, I get as many answers as I do um, um, people I talk to. And it's it's to me, sustainability is about a balance between business, about the environment, and about a, com a strong community as well. And this, this is getting to a core of the matter. What we did in advance of the Rio Plus 20 Summit is we commissioned some work from an organization called True Cost, and we got them to look at if an industry had to pay its full direct and indirect environmental cost, what would that do to the profitability of the industry? In the center there, you see food product. Oh, let's go the food producers here. Globally in 2010, the food production sector made around about US $89 billion of EBITDA. If it had to pay the full environmental cost of that, that would have been 224% of that profit, or $199 billion US dollars. The sector, if it hadn't been able to pass that cost through, and if you think about globally where we're sitting in terms of governments, very unlikely to be willing to accept cost increases of that sort of dimension, um, we, we have a severe issue. What we're seeing around the world is regulation is being designed to pass more and more of these costs, these environmental costs, through to the food production sector at the real risk to, I think, the financial viability of the sector. To me, that says the sector has got to be very engaged with its community and it's got to be very engaged with rule makers to actually get a position where um, the appropriate rules are set and the appropriate costs are passed through, but the, the critical role the sector plays. Michael, we'll try and sort that out. <laughs> Apologies. Sounds like the dentist. Painful dentist. <laughs> <laughs> I think when, when you get to the core of this, though, if, if, we regulate, if, we, if we have free regulation and if we really pass these costs dramatically down to the food sector, we get a very difficult position. It's interesting when you look at the oil and gas sector, if you take the same sort of 
cost basis, it's direct and indirect environmental costs are only 154 billion US dollars. So the food sector, because it uses more water, it uses more land, has much greater impact on an environment than any other sector and therefore is most at risk from this sort of reg regulation. Run quickly through production systems, but from my perspective, I think the, the primary sector is inherently an innovative sector. You know, as pastoral based economies, we've relied heavily on great um, innovations over the time in animal genetics, in terms of forage genetic or forage improvements, animal health, all those sort of steps are, are inherent. The uptake of innovation is extremely high in the primary sector. But from my perspective, it's not fast enough. If you look at the percentages that we're spending in the primary sector on R&D, they are relatively low in comparison to other technology-based sectors. So I think there is a need for more investment in R&D, more investment in technology to move this sector forward faster. Um, for, it was interesting when I was talking again in people in Russia, they said to me, genetics is really important. And I said, yeah, that's right, you've got to get the good cows in. And they said, it's not just about the, the animal genetics, it's absolutely about the people genetics. So globally, getting the right people into an agricultural environment, encouraging talent into the primary sector is a challenge. It's a significant challenge in New Zealand where we called the industry a sunset industry for 25 years. But I met from talking with David, it's, it's also a challenge here about how you attract the best talent in, how you grow your businesses through good people. And that comes down partly from my perspective to adoption of IT. If we don't have good IT infrastructure, if we don't have con connectivity, you can't attract the best people into the industry. Plus you can't use technology effectively in your business to get the best outcomes in terms of production pr tracking, production monitoring, and then decision making support. The sector has historically been a slow adopter of technology. That needs to change as well, and globally, I think the applications are starting to become available to drive that change. I always like to briefly mention genetics. I know it's a, it's a challenging question here as it is in New Zealand, but getting a clear view on how genetics is going to be used in the agricultural sector globally, I think, is critical. We can't afford to ignore genetics, but equally for countries like Ireland, like New Zealand, where we do produce premium product, there may be a strong argument for trying to maintain a relatively genetic-free um, environment if we can command a premium price for that sort of productivity. Agriculture is very much an infrastructure game from my perspective. And I think when, when you look at it, water is critically important, having the right irrigation systems in place, ensuring that we've got water storage and capture, that we're using it effectively, recycling it is really important. I've already touched on communications and broadband. In New Zealand, I'm extremely frustrated that I've just had a fibre um, cable put outside my door in, in Auckland, because now I can download movies faster. That contributes not one iota of economic potential to New Zealand. If we actually spent the money putting rural broadband in, getting communication faster, we would get far better outcomes, far better economic outcomes for the country. Transportation and supply chain is really important as well. And particularly as you think about how you move products out of developed countries into developing countries, ensuring they've, that they've got the cool supply chains that will deliver the outcomes you need to get the product to market in the condition it needs to be. Significant challenge, particularly looking at China. Also to me, if we're going to get the best people in the industry, getting social infrastructure right, having the right schools, having the right hospitals, having the support services in place, and in recognising that we need to support people in the communities to actually stay in the communities is also a piece of infrastructure that can't be overlooked. As a bottom line around production systems, traceability and safety is critically important. I, I think from, from the perspective I sit looking in from outside, Ireland has come out of the, the horse meat scandal extremely well. Um, it has demonstrated that it's got traceability systems and secure processes in place that identify problems and the integrity to stand up and admit those problems. I contrast that on the other side of the slide to Fonterra. And unfortunately, I don't think they've come out of what they've done in China and the whey protein scare that's taken place in the last few months nearly as well. I think the challenges that they've recognised is 
they need to have better communication. You need to put your consumer at centre of any of those sort of issues. We didn't do that. We don't do it as well in Honey. So we've got some things we can definitely learn from you in that space. And that brings through to markets. I think when you talk about markets, to me, the, I've already touched on the fact we're getting consumers that are more advanced, wanting more, the more complex proteins. Part of that shows through in the, um, the, the growing demand for non-food agri non agricultural products. So growing demands for grains, mainly to feed more animals, to produce more animal proteins. But also, I think, from ra some rather distortionary activities we see in respect to biofuels. We've also got change in protein requirements. And what I mean there is, particularly when you look at the growing markets in Asia, for 5,000 years, those people have eaten foods because they bring them health benefits. They're what we now call nutraceuticals or functional foods, but it is part of the culture in countries like China. So we can't afford to overlook the fact that that's what they've historically done and will continue to do. So it is becoming a growing trend in the Western world, but it's already a trend in the developing world. Trade liberalisation is opening the market up very, very quickly. And I think how you can design business systems to work around the complex web of um, multilateral and bilateral trade agreements that are being developed is very, very important. And a real challenge when you look in particular into the Asia-Pacific region. Getting your minds around trans-Pacific partnership is something that is, is really important to work out where you can go in terms of reducing cost in market. I come back to the comment I made earlier about for countries like Ireland, countries like New Zealand, the need to focus on a, a, um, a premium customer. And from my perspective, you know, we can probably both feed somewhere around about 30 to 40 million people. Our focus, though, should be on trying to feed 5% off a diet of 400, 500 million people. Actually working out where we can add most value to that diet and where the people with the biggest checkbooks are to pay for that food is, to my mind, a critical step in how we go forward. But also when you think about it, those consumers are the consumers that want a connection with their farmer. They want to understand where the products come from. They actually like organics and they like stuff that actually brings them what they perceive to be a better lifestyle. So also how we use technology smartly to maintain that close connection is really important to making our food local in an international market. I think it's worth noting as well, we are seeing more and more pressure for healthy eating as producers of dairy products, which have, by, by their nature, a fat component, as producers of beef products, which by their nature have fat components, understanding that, working out how we present products to the consumer that comply and achieve healthy eating goals, doing the research behind that to pr improve the integrity of our products are really important, as is realising that commodity prices are volatile. You know, the dairy price is not going to be at this current level forever. So building that flexibility into our businesses to be able to respond to those, that volatility, again, significant challenge, but something we can't afford to overlook. Just moving quickly through a couple of other market items. We've, we asked 15 of our agricultural business groups around the world, what, what are the key drivers? 14 of those countries I'm, came back with price as being the key driver of agricultural purchasing decisions. I have to say, unfortunately, New Zealand was the one that didn't. Um, but I think the fundamental message is price is still king, but then safety, traceability, security of supply are all on people's agendas. So when you're looking in the market, you'll only get through the door and be able to do, a, do the deal if the price is right, but then all the other things will be expected as well. And then when you look at what the major retailers are, are asking, and we've done some analysis of that recently, effectively those 10 retailers up there trade um, in 91 countries, turn over somewhere around about $1.3 trillion US dollars. And it's interesting when you look at what they're trying to do. They're very focused on responding to austerity. So they're looking at how they bring prices down. Arcan's a great example. It now has a base range of products it sells quite openly at cost as a way of responding to the austerity pressures that government's putting on them. They're looking to focus and source local products from small and medium-sized enterprises. Car4 there is a, a, a good example. Their stated goal in every country they operate in, they're in about 33 countries, is they're looking for um, 
75% of the product to be sourced from local, small and medium sized suppliers. So they'll do certain things on a big scale, but they're also wanting to play in the local market. The other one there I think is worth pointing to is the creation and ownership of own brands. I take an example there from Australia, where Coles Group, the second biggest retail chain, has a stated objective of 70% of everything it sells being on its own label. So therefore you need to be very aware as to how you balance the development of a branded product in market because it's not as clear cut as just going all out on branding because there's only a limited amount of real estate for branded product. So what we've done in the Agribusiness Agenda series is a, a series of publications we put together based on interviews we have with a, over 100 sort of sector leaders in New Zealand is actually what, what are the cores to creating a customer-centric business? To me, understanding the attributes of your, what your customer requires of the product and how your product meets those attributes is critical. Integrating with customers, and what I mean there is how you actually use the IP that's inherent within the products we produce and put that into other people's supply chains. So whether that's actually um, being an ingredient component within a product or if it's actually about using our brand or it's about direct supply, there are many different ways you can do that to integrate into a customer's supply chain more effectively. I've already mentioned government policy. The resilience to change is critical. If you look at China, they've just changed the policy again this weekend. They had a meeting and the policy's changed. And it's that sort of thing that happens in much of the developing world. So being resilient to those changes and recognizing that the environment today may not be the environment tomorrow is important. Total market immersion. Now for me, this is something as a small country, coming from a small country where we sell most of what we produce overseas is really important. But you need to have people that are deep in the market. I look at our boards in New Zealand's primary sector companies and I don't see many Chinese people. Yet we sell seven billion dollars of worth of products in China a year. I look at our companies and I don't see enough people placed in market, living and breathing the cultures that we're selling to every day, getting the latest trends and getting those messages back. I think it will be the same for you as well. The more international markets you play on, the greater the risk that you don't succeed. So focusing on the markets you can win in, the niche that we have the opportunity is really important. Also doing things, <coughs> doing things differently is important. Excuse me. And then what, I get, what I'm getting at there is the concept of Apple versus Blackberry. The ability to look at your market and not do the same thing. I think one of the challenges I see, and I, look at, I see it in our red meat sector in New Zealand, we do the same thing, I've been doing the same thing for 25 years, and we just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. It doesn't make the, the, the company attractive to young people. It doesn't meet the needs of the customers that are changing and evolving. So it is really important that if we do want to progress, we want to grow, we need to be prepared to evolve our business model. We need to look at the world through a Steve Jobs lens. And that can be challenging for the primary sector. Preserving consumer trust is an absolute bottom line. We can't afford to overlook that as is achieving a position of scale. And I, I look across our primary sector in New Zealand and I see us producing avocados. And we can only deliver avocados once every two years. And I go, well, how can we ever get a competitive market position in avocados if we can only supply for four weeks a, four, a four week gap every two years? We never will. So producing the right product and producing a product that you can have a dominant market position in, where you can dominate the niche you can win in is really critical and then putting the right story around that. And that story is not just about the environment the food comes from, the beautiful rivers, the scenery I saw this morning driving down here once the sun came out. It's about safety. It's about integrity. It's about the efficacy with which the product's produced and telling that story to the world in an open, positive manner and then doing what you've done with Origin Green and backing it with an absolute integrity system that's, that requires every farmer to play is to my mind the way you win in a market. And why is that important? I, I think it's important for two reasons, and this is what I've tried to distill here. I, I spend a lot of, we spend a lot of time in KPMG in New Zealand thinking about why. why. Why do we get out of bed? Why do we come to work every day? 
and I've applied that to the primary sector and this the statement I put up on the screen there around why do we do agriculture in New Zealand and it comes back to if you can if you can't say why you're doing something how can you take the community with you you have the huge advantage in Ireland of having your um, your your long-term food and agri strategy your food harvest 2020 strategy to my mind that it sets a roadmap it enables you to tell people where you want to go with your primary sector and therefore how you need to use the resources to go to that position. That creates the basis for a sustainable primary sector. We don't have that in New Zealand, but we need to. And it's one of those areas where if we're going to have engagement and work out how the wider community wants us to use water, what the wider community's view is around housing animals, all those sort of difficult questions around the use of genetic modification we can only answer those if we actually can articulate to them where we're going to go and how that will help improve the lifestyle of the country. Strategy is critical. Being able to distill the why, therefore, becomes really important to creating a sustainable sector. What I've just got now is a couple of slides just more specifically on New Zealand, and I won't dwell on these too long because I know we'll talk about this more in, in some of the later slides. But if you look here, dairy is critical in New Zealand, dairy is critical to Ireland. And this slide is one that's just I picked up out of a pack that um, Fonterra used around the middle of this year. And um, you can see in India and in China, the demand growth levels significantly higher than the supply growth level. And if you think about the size of those markets, they the create huge potential opportunity for real growth. You know, ASEAN, in fact, most of the developing markets of Africa are looking for more dairy as well. The, the, the opportunity, therefore, is huge for countries that are exporters of dairy products. My, my basic perception is prices are, are at a new plane. They're, they're at a level where they, I don't expect them to go back down to where we saw prices in the, the early part of this millennium or this century. But they will be volatile. The US, as you'll be well aware, has great ability to turn supply on and off quite quickly. And our expectation is at the moment supply will be switched on pretty quickly. In New Zealand this year, we've had our best spring ever. And last spring was the best spring ever as well. So the milk flows, Fonterra have actually been dumping milk for the first time, which is quite um, a significant that they haven't actually got enough capacity to process everything that's been collected. The industry is susceptible to food scares, which is um, quite scary um, in terms of what we see in China. The product is, is easily distortable. It's supplied in powder format generally, and therefore you know, we've seen the melamine problems with San Lu. And tight supply positions create the incentives for people to, to take advantage. Therefore, the integrity of the brand how you can trace the DNA of your product from your plant to the consumer becomes really, really important. I also question our traditional <coughs> approach to exporting milk, and this is something that does play in my mind a reasonable amount. We spend an awful lot of time working out how to take water out of milk efficiently, quickly, and at as low cost as possible, and then send it to countries that I've already demonstrated are short on water. So long term, to my perspective, global, global food exports are going to be very much around global water exports and how you move water around the world. So being able to export liquid milk more effectively at a lower cost and deliver a liquid product, I think, is something that we can't afford to ignore. Uh, I know we're already seeing a number of Chinese companies starting to come into New Zealand with the goal of setting up UHT plants. <coughs> because they're starting to see that as the future rather than a powdered product. So I think there's, there's a lot of scope for innovation in that space. I also see this challenge between pasture-based systems and housed farming systems as, as a real, real area where countries like New Zealand and Ireland are going to need to think about that in some detail. Um, when you look at what they produce in the States, compared to what we produce in our countries, there's quite a difference in, in supply, or supply per animal. Um, 
you know, it could be two to three times greater in the US from the same animal. The inconsistency of supply of a pasture system also presents challenge, but absolutely, as the chairman of Fonterra has told me on numerous occasions, it also gives us a real cost advantage. So working out how, how we balance that is really, really important. So just a quick run through, and I'll pick up a few of what I see as our strengths. We're on the doorstep of Asia, so we're in a very geographically advantageous position. We have a great position of high integrity, um, and with the sectors we do export in, dairy, sheep meat, venison, kiwi fruit, we've got dominant positions in those key sectors. Um, and I think the cooperative spirit is really important and can't be overlooked. It has kept New Zealand ownership of the assets. We have an ownership down the supply chain, which I think is really important. And I think you know, it's recognised as being a differentiator. That said, I also think it's actually a limiting factor on us. The gumboot politics of um, the cooperatives is a challenge. It does mean that we need to work very hard to get the right skills on our boards because the representation that does come to the boards isn't necessarily going to be the right people. The licence to operate is under pressure. Um, New Zealand itself is becoming a more and more Asian country. You win Auckland, you win New Zealand, and Aucklanders are disconnected from farms. We've got a rural-urban divide that's growing quite significantly. We also are generally a sort of, we like a deal. As a country, we're traders, so we've got a scattergun approach to market development. We're not targeted or working on the niches we can win in. We'll take any opportunity that comes along and that, as a consequence, doesn't necessarily deliver to us the best outcomes. And the other one there I'll just point on is the intergeneration, intergenerational R&D. New Zealand's success was driven by the investment we made in the 60s and 70s in developing our pastoral technologies. We're not doing that intergenerational R&D at the moment, and that's critically important if we're going to be a sustainable industry, but that, in that sort of long-term investment continues to be made. Even though it's not going to pay back now or in 10 years' time, the sector can't afford to not to make the investment. So there's some observations. Very happy to take questions afterwards.